bass and drums, and of course yowling banshee vocals, mix in some misty medieval lyrics, season with teen anger, top with leather and chains, and maybe a shot of spandex, turn the whole mess up to 20, and you've got heavy metal. It's gotta be loud. It's got to be. It's like square dancing in a blender. Rebellious, loud, nasty. Hard rock. Put in fifth gear. Heavy metal is, or originally was, loud. And unlike today's thrash music, it wasn't fast. In fact, its many critics found it leaden and ponderous. Heavy metal was made with guitars, played exclusively by young men. Its themes were anti-authoritarian, often in a melancholy sword and sorcery mode, and were aimed directly at testosterone-plagued adolescent boys, which a new crop, of course, sprouts up each year, thus assuring heavy metal a virtually eternal audience. You look the part, you know, you live the part, you go to concerts, you, you buy the records, you watch it, the videos, you, you get the posters, it, you live like almost like you're in a heavy metal band. You know, they got their ripped up jeans or whatever, their bull belts, the ripped up t-shirts, and the, the girls have their tight, stretchy black pants on and spandex tops, and uh, you just go nuts, man, for the music. It sounds cliche, but metal is more than just the music. It really is a lifestyle. It's people feeling the same way with music as the focal point. You love it. I'm so bad, baby, I don't care. Heavy metal never sought to make anyone dance or feel tenderly romantic. The original metal music was a gob of spit in the face of rock art, as Henry Miller might have put it, a celebration of sex and drugs and rock and roll that offered no apologies and asked no quarter from the many clueless moralists it has delighted in offending over the years. The outrageous edge of rock and roll has shifted its focus from Elvis's pelvis to the saw protruding from Blackie Lawless's codpiece on a Wasp album. Rock lyrics have turned from I can't get no satisfaction to I'm going to force you at gunpoint to eat me alive. Everybody's like scared of something. And no matter what you do, it's going to offend somebody. There's people out there just dying to get offended, looking to be offended, you know, writing things down in notebooks to be offended. Jesus. So what? Why shouldn't they be offended? What have they done that they shouldn't be offended? They're offending me by trying not to be offended themselves. Screw them. If somebody sees a spider climbing up the wall, the first thing they do is kill it. That's the first reaction people have. And anything that is intimidating, the first thing they want to do is stomp on it or kill it or ban it. If any theme offered the promise of outraging the powers that be, heavy metal went for it. Sex, death, Satanism. Metal offered a cartoon apocalypse for millions of hormonally addled fans in their fight against figures of authority everywhere. Misconceptions about metal are, I think, made because people are afraid of it. Uh, we have always been the rebels. We always write from the dark side of music. We always write in minor keys. When you write in minor keys, you frighten people. It always bespeaks of the devil. And let's face it, we aren't out there exactly waving the flag of goodness, uh, but nor are 99.9% .9 of us waving the flag of the devil either. Although death is an everyday subject on the evening news, when metal acts deal with it, they're often charged with promoting teen suicide. Inevitably, among teens who were troubled to begin with, and even when the song in question is an anti-suicide tune, such as singer Ozzy Osbourne's by now notorious Suicide Solution. I've never, ever, ever had a record that I've made that with, my, with, my, with the intention of people to harm themselves. Never. Because that's a stupid thing to even think of, you know. I've written, I mean, I've written things that I feel, you know, and things that I'm interested in. Not practice, you know, I don't practice black magic. I've never had. Drugs and alcohol are at the root of all these problems, and I think a lot of parents are trying to pass the buck, if you don't want me saying.
The lengths to which grown-ups will go to place the blame for their own shortcomings as parents on metal musicians was vividly illustrated in last year's trial of the veteran British metal band Judas Priest, which was charged with somehow incorporating deadly subliminal messages into its music. There are no subliminal messages on our album, but we do feel that a statement's been made. I mean, we, we're sort of proud of our role in a way, for we've flown the, the flag for, uh, for rock and roll, heavy metal music in general, because it seems to us that time and time again now, music is, is being made the scapegoat for every bad thing that occurs, you know. We're here to tell the truth and to prove once and for all during our defence that there are no subliminal messages on Better By You, Better Than Me. There are no subliminal messages in any way, shape or form on any Judas Priest record. <laughs> we'll get back to rock and roll now and, uh, and heavy metal. <laughs> Music may have started right here. I always remember when I heard, you've really got me by the kinks for the first time. It's like my, my hair was standing on end, you know. That's what I like to go for. When I get that off of our records, it's, a, it's like, ooh. Although fuzzed out guitar sounds are now available to anyone able to pick up a $50 foot pedal, they were sort of revolutionary back in 1964 when kinks guitarist Dave Davies invented his own way of making them. When I did, took the front off of this particular amplifier that I had, and um, I slit the, sp the speaker comb with a razor blade. And I plugged it in. It's a great sound. <laughs> Also shredding its sound around the same time was another English mod group, The Who, which took sonic aggression one giant step further and set the style for two generations of guitar-bashing rock and roll extroverts. consequence of all this high volume guitar assault was the previously unwanted phenomenon of feedback, which became an expressive tool in the hands of such guitarists as Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck. But the master of feedback art was unquestionably the great Jimi Hendrix. It's very obvious that Hendrix was probably the most unique um, guitar player um, in existence. He's probably the catalyst that invented the you know the instrument and what you know what we're doing today. If he wasn't doing what he did then, we'd all probably all be playing acoustic guitars now or something. Hendrix, Beck, and Clapton were all brilliant players for whom distortion was an artistic option. Less skilled musicians, however, quickly took to this new kind of noise as well. Among them, such proto metal acts as Blue Cheer. may have been the watershed year for heavy metal music. The unabashed high-volume riff-mongering of such bands as Blue Cheer and the even more primitive Iron Butterfly set the stage, and another California act, Steppenwolf, adopting a scientific term by way of William Burroughs' underground novel Naked Lunch, went all the way to number two with the first song ever about heavy metal thunder. I like smoking lightning Heavy metal thunder That same year, over in England, a new band called Led Zeppelin was formed out of the ashes of the disbanded Yardbirds. And while Zeppelin did come on all loud and distorted and reeling off riffs, the band itself, despite the many heavy metal progeny it spawned, was always much more than just that. We were everything, really. We, 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 we touched so many different areas of, uh, of just the normal sort of the blues and, and rock and, 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 uh, and, and the acoustic, but then we also went into other areas. <laughs> Mm. Bash. Zepp has been every drum sample, every bass drum, every snare beat, every oh, all that sort of thing is all over the place. <laughs> By 
Finally, in 1969, there appeared in England a band that aspired to nothing more than maximum riff mania, and which essentially laid down the blueprint for most of the heavy metal that... Heavy metal band was a band that I was in, and that was Black Sabbath. Uh, that, of course, the original heavy metal band, Black Sabbath, was the band that Ozzy Osbourne was in. I was in the second coming or going of Black Sabbath, whichever way you look at it. Um, that was the band that I always looked to as being the monster band, the monster heavy metal band. It stomped through your tongue like Godzilla. Sabbath threw open the heavy metal floodgates through which poured such classic acts as Deep Purple, Mountain, the punkish Alice Cooper band, and a little later, Kiss. Cooper and Kiss introduced elements of theatricality and sold tons of albums and concert tickets. But by the mid-70s, with disco on the rise and heavy metal as undanceable as ever, an inevitable decline set in. The music was only rescued, ironically enough, by punk rock, which introduced a higher speed limit, quickly adopted by the English band Motorhead, and by a burgeoning pop consciousness promoted by such groups as the Irish Thin Lizzy and LA's own Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen, the first metal guitar virtuoso, introduced a dazzling hammer-on technique that changed the way many hard rockers played, although Van Halen himself displayed little interest in such imitation. I never had guitar lessons. I just kind of picked it up. Maybe that's why I, I do some of the weird stuff that I do, because, you know, nobody... Whenever you do something by the book, it's like you can't do anything outside of the book. So how's anyone supposed to come up with, with anything new if they go by that old book? So I guess I'm kind of writing my own book. Eddie Van Halen gave the new breed of faster, less heavy metal something it sorely needed. Undeniable instrumental credibility. From a buzz clip to a number one hit, Nirvana performing live at the MTV Studios during Rock and Rapathon and 120 Minutes. Nirvana, this weekend, see what the buzz is about on MTV. At the time we came out, the knack was really big. And with my Sharona and all that stuff, and we were playing the clubs, and all of our friends in other rock bands had cut their hair off and got their little skinny ties, and that was the flavor of the week. By 1980, punk rock had been housebroken and turned into new wave for radio consumption. Metal music had been forced underground. funeral and everything and then we decided my brother said well we can sit around and mope or we've got we had been working on tracks for the like the back and black album and they said we could get in and just do what we're doing and then from there decide what we're going to do if any proof were needed that metal really was popular music acdc provided it by finally cracking the u.s top 40 with the resounding hit you shook me all night long a song that helped open the door for metal on the radio.
Then in 1981, MTV appeared, and suddenly metal acts could be seen as well as heard by a whole new generation of fans. One play on MTV is like 2,000 radio stations. In this day and age, you know, video is a big thing, and, and you know, you, you expect to see a video from a song, and if you don't, you know, it's like there's something missing now. As the mid-80s approached, metal music was once again huge, providing renewed popularity for such veteran acts as Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest, and such newcomers as the platinum-selling Iron Maiden. The metal renaissance had also sparked a raucous, glam-drenched scene in, of all places, sunny Los Angeles. There was punk rock, and there was bands like ourselves. Rat was coming out. Um, Quiet Riot was defunct, but there was Debro. Um, there was a handful of bands. There was Wasp, and that was exciting. It was as far over the edge as you could get, and it was real. And that was a great time for us, you know. Um, it was honest. Now you got people faking it, and, and that's, that's not happening. I, I hate that. Inevitably, with the resurgence of metal record sales, came attempts to expand the music's market by toning down its raw sound and anti-authoritarian stance. The result was a proliferation of pop metal, the invasion of the haircut bands. <laughs> I think what's happened to heavy metal in the past few years is that uh, people have seen that, that uh, you can make a lot of money off of it and they've really milked it dry, you know, um, by, by misconstruing what heavy metal is. A lot of other people, you know, they dress the way that heavy metal people dress or they play the volume that people that play heavy metal play or they sing about the certain things that heavy metal play and they don't even really realize what the whole movement's about or, or the genuine integrity that heavy metal stands for, you know. It's like going against society and, and, and uh, actually speaking out about stuff that and most people don't have the balls to sing about. The hardcore metal audience wasn't fooled by this sudden eruption of fake metal, however, and its hankering for non-hyped, makeup-free metal music was soon served by a new breed of revved-up speed metal acts. I think, you know, very early on in this band, we set out realizing that there's so many cliches in heavy metal up through the 80s that if we can't better them, then let's not touch them, do you know what I mean? Things like singing about girls and drugs and, you know, Satanism and all this crap. I mean, it's just too boring. I mean, it's a bit more of a challenge to, um, to try and come up with things that are a bit different. It's more fun. <laughs> In the 90s, metal is not only bigger than ever, it's increasingly influential. Many rap records lift metal riffs, and bands such as Faith No More, Jane's Addiction, Queensryche, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers are taking metal in wild new directions. The form of the music may change, but clearly the bleat goes on. 